we have Nicole DiPietrio on the line from ULI, Louisiana, who is hosting today's session. And I am Natasha Walker from ULI Triangle. I'm your co-host. Uh, our mission at ULI is to provide leadership in the responsible use of land and create, creating and sustaining thriving communities worldwide. Um, in the community, we exchange ideas and best practices through education and networking opportunities, including monthly building tours, happy hours, quarterly breakfast series, education panels, and then two of our biggest events, or one of our biggest events is the annual Emerging Trends in Real Estate Conference that we do every year. Uh, our members within the organizations are everything from developers, architects, engineers, contractors, attorneys, financial professionals, brokers, public officials, and students. Our reach, uh, 43,000 members uh, worldwide. We have 293 members across Louisiana and 639 members in the Triangle. We'd like to give a special thank you to our annual sponsors in Louisiana and our annual sponsors in the Triangle. A few of our upcoming events, as you guys know, this is our first session for the Color of Law Book Club. We will have a, our second and third sessions on August the 11th and September the 15th. And then there will also be a new member orientation for ULI Louisiana on August the 21st. We have an additional facilitator with us today, Anita Brown Graham. Um, Anita works at UNC School of Government and she rejoined the School of Government in September of 2016 to lead the public launch of NC Impact, a special initiative that seeks to expand the school's capacity to work with public officials on complex policy issues. Um, Anita originally began her career as a law clerk in e the Eastern District of California, and she is a William C. Friday Fellow, American Marshall Fellow, and Eisenhower Fellow. In 2013, the White House named her as a champion of change for her work at IEI, and the Triangle Business Journal named her a 2014 Women in Business for her policy leadership in the state and a 2017 CEO of the year. She currently serves on several boards and organizations, and she earned her undergraduate degree from Louisiana State University and a law UNC Chapel Hill. So just bringing everything full circle. Today's facilitator is Chris Tyson. Um, Chris is a Newman Trowbridge Distinguished Professor of Law at Louisiana State University and President and CEO at Bill Baton Rouge. Uh, professor Tyson joined the Law Center faculty in 2010 as an assistant professor, and he teaches and writes in the areas of property, real estate development, local government, law, and urban land and use and development. And with that said, I am going to turn it over to Chris. All right. Thank you, uh, Natasha uh, and Nicole uh, and Brian for having me and uh, thank all of thank you to all of you for joining us for the book club. I'm really excited to host this. This is actually the second time that I've had an opportunity to share about uh, the color of law through a book club. Uh, and uh, I think you will all find, as I hope you are and you're reading the book, this is a really important work and a really necessary conversation uh, for us to, to be having at this time. When I first did this in, in 2018, uh, certainly uh, the issues that are animating uh, social movements around the globe right now uh, were in focus, but they certainly weren't as intense as they are right now. Um, as the nation is uh, in many ways taken to the streets or at least uh, taking to conversations and other spaces where they can share with each other to understand and, and in many cases relearn our history of race uh, and inequality in the country. Um, uh, the color of law is an important tool uh, that we can use to unearth uh, this uh, history that is all around us, but so uh, poorly understood and, and, and has received uh, in the past so little consideration in, in broader retellings of American history and, and, and our understanding of how we came to be who we are. So uh, I think it's an important work and I, I hope you will enjoy this book club uh, and the book uh, and the conversations and all of the information that we're gonna share as we move through it. Uh, I thought it would be helpful in addition to the uh, bio that's on the screen right now, just to give you a little uh, uh, more on my background. I think it's important for us to, to 
be reflective, particularly in conversations like this, uh, about how and, and where we enter these conversations. Um, uh, talking about race and inequality, um, uh, uh, and particularly uh, our life in cities uh, and the, the ways in which cities shape our culture, our society, uh, and uh, our experience in cities uh, reflects uh, a history of resource distributions and maldistributions, uh, 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 privilege, disadvantage, um, and uh, a host of, of cultural and social factors that uh, uh, have uh, profound resonance for uh, how we live our lives today and how we uh, think of ourselves as citizens and neighbors uh, in the cities in which we, we live. Uh, so I wanted to give a little bit of my background and kind of use that as a way to go into a discussion on, on the book. And as I understand, I'm going to speak to you for about 30 minutes. And Natasha and Nicole, I guess I'll, I'll look to you all to uh, just flag for me. Uh, maybe if you can give me a five minute warning uh, so I can, I can wrap it up and we'll have an opportunity to speak uh, both in the breakout sessions and then in the report back later on. And I look forward to participating in those conversations and hearing your uh, reactions and feedback uh, at that time. So I am a Baton Rouge native and uh, born and raised here. Uh, I left here and attended Howard University in Washington, D.C. Uh, for college. Uh, had my first job in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, which is actually where I bought my first home and, and uh, stayed there for a number of years before returning to school for a master's in public policy uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School. I should mention in, in Washington, D.C. at Howard University, I studied architecture. So my undergraduate degree is in architecture. Uh, at that time, was very interested as I continue to be uh, in cities, urban development, real estate, and architecture. Uh, after completing my master's of public policy, uh, and I, in that program, I focused on social inequality. I continued on uh, to uh, obtain a law degree uh, back in D.C. at Georgetown. I had the opportunity to work in the United States Senate with former Senator Mary Landrieu at that time, uh, a job I began the day after Hurricane Katrina struck. Uh, I worked the Katrina year. Uh, I returned to Baton Rouge uh, after completing law school from D.C. Uh, and began practicing as a real estate and land use attorney, uh, representing developers uh, and, and uh, other companies as they uh, developed projects. Uh, and I did that for a number of years before taking a position on the law faculty at LSU where I teach property, real estate development, issues in urban land use and development, and local government law. My scholarship is mostly in local government law, where I have been interested in issues surrounding uh, municipal boundaries uh, and uh, the, the spatialization of race uh, and the racialization of space, if you will. Uh, and so uh, I've enjoyed having an opportunity to thread all of those experiences into my current role, which is CEO of Build Baton Rouge. Build Baton Rouge is our city's redevelopment authority. And as such, we are focused on uh, equitable urban development, community engagement, public finance, uh, all towards transforming our city's disinvested neighborhoods back into areas of, of viability and in accord uh, with what those uh, communities uh, want to see in their neighborhoods. Um, and it's an interesting time to be doing that work. I think we more than uh, we have uh, in recent memory uh, have a heightened awareness of housing affordability, gentrification, urban transformation, spatial inequality. Uh, these are conversations that have kind of penetrated uh, the mainstream consciousness and people of all walks of life are aware of these issues uh, and actively involved in various efforts to address these issues in their local communities. And while these issues are highly local, uh, they are also national issues, particularly when we understand the underlying uh, policy uh, and economic and financial uh, web of, of, of forces that shape what's going on in housing markets, uh, in urban development, in the evolution of cities, um, in the politics of geography. Uh, when we think about all of that, uh, we know that those things are simultaneously hyper-local, uh, but they also relate to these broader things going on uh, in the country. Um, so that's kind of how I approach uh, the work of the color of, of law. I think uh, like many scholars who uh, first engaged the color of law, it was uh, incredibly rewarding to see uh, this work uh, 
which many people have long studied, but has kind of been an academic, uh, uh, I think, conversation more so than a mainstream one. Uh, and what, what, what Rothstein does here that I think is, is uh, really helpful for us is he weaves a, a very uh, 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 voluminous public policy and political history uh, through very compelling and very cogent uh, narrative stories, right? That we get to engage people, and we'll talk about some of that today, uh, and see the impact of these policies and politics through their lived experiences. That is very helpful because, um, uh, you know, going through the uh, minutia of redlining of their home uh, uh, owners, uh, loan corporation, or the, the uh, different aspects of the New Deal housing policy. Uh, for some people, for me, you know, I geek out about it, uh, but for some people that can be a bit of a snooze. And so it's helpful to in, uh, engage this information through uh, narrative and through uh, storytelling, which I think Rothstein has done pretty well here. And I think that makes it uh, very uh, accessible for us. I think that this work is also important because it gives us an alternate narrative for the things that we encounter every day uh, uh, that we think we know the answers to, uh, uh, but in many cases, uh, we, there are holes in the information uh, and the background understandings that uh, 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 kind of support uh, our conclusions. What do I mean by that? Well. If you, uh, wherever you are, and I know we are in Louisiana, North Carolina, and maybe many other places on this call, uh, wherever you are, uh, you likely have areas of affluence and areas of poverty and disadvantage uh, in the cities or towns or, or wherever it is that you, you may live. For many people, uh, when they look at neighborhoods that are chronically blighted, uh, where they see areas that are concentrated with crime, um, uh, dilapidated housing, uh, 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 inadequate infrastructure, uh, where there are uh, concentrations of, of people who may be unemployed, experiencing all levels of, of scarcity and desperation. Um, uh, we tend to um, uh, rationalize what is going on right, as the cumulative result of people's poor choice making. All right, there's a lot in our society uh, that uh, has led us to uh, uh, deduce that what is happening in disinvested neighborhoods that we may observe in any city uh, everywhere in the country uh, is largely an individualized phenomenon uh, that um, therefore justifies the segregated patterns that we see in the city, right? Who wants to live next to people who don't share your values, right? Uh, who wants to live next to people who you feel uh, don't uphold uh, uh, a certain, um, uh, uh, don't indicate good choice making, right? Uh, or don't exhibit uh, strong, uh, a strong work ethic or uh, respect and pride uh, for uh, their neighborhoods. And if we see that uh, in uh, landscapes that are blighted and disinvested and dilapidated, um, uh, then we very well may assume, right, that uh, the rational thing to do uh, is to separate myself from that, right? Uh, because where I live um, uh, is, is one of the highest stakes decisions that I will make in my life, right? Our home uh, is our castle. Uh, it is also the place where our family happens. Uh, I think as the Zillow commercial says, it's, it's where our life happens, right? Um, uh, it is also likely our largest investment, uh, our ticket to the middle class or out of poverty or out of or into intergenerational wealth, right? Uh, it, it is a place where our neighbors uh, are, are, are defining our own social networks and, and our sense of community. Uh, it is our refuge. Right? Uh, so where we live, the politics of location in the metropolis are extremely high stakes for us. Uh, and they always have been. Uh, we think of that, as I've just explained, right? We think of that as a set of rational responses to uh, a, a social phenomena that is inevitable, uh, that is in many ways pre-political, uh, is natural, 
and beyond our ability to individually control. Uh, and so while it may be unfortunate that the city is racially segregated, while it may be unfortunate that poverty uh, is concentrated uh, in places, uh, maybe that's what those people deserve, or maybe it's just beyond my ability to control, right? That's just the way it is. And so I want us to think through that, uh, not just as we move through through these initial four chapters in the preface today. But as we go through the entire book, uh, are we encountering um, a, a narrative that is challenging and pushing the ways in which uh, we've uh, been taught to think about uh, the way that, that, that cities work? Uh, uh, the reasons behind uh, the level of segregation uh, and separation uh, and, and what I like to call racial and spatial stratification that defines most American cities, certainly the one that I live in. Um, uh, so I offer that, you know, kind of uh, set of, 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 of priors and, and, and maybe the, the, the straw man that I've created here uh, uh, for us to think about as we engage uh, this text. Rothstein starts in the preface uh, with um, uh, setting the stage for us um, uh, in uh, being clear about um, his central theme uh, that the notion that what we observe in our cities, particularly reg with regards to uh, residential segregation uh, and the concentration and racialization of, of, of poverty and space, um, is indeed uh, the, the result of, of government action. Uh, and, and, and in making that claim, he is pushing back, uh, as he indicates, uh, on uh, dominant um, uh, kind of political uh, logic, uh, but also uh, what the court has done, right? And, and Rothstein is setting his sights on uh, the the Reconstruction Amendments, right? The 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, he mentions that. Uh, and he settles on the 13th Amendment, right? Which outlaws uh, slavery uh, as uh, being violated uh, by a, a, a hundred year set of policies uh, that actually um, um, give the, the um, the, the imprint of, of slavery and second-class citizenship to, to Black Americans uh, through a, a host of, of, of measures to not only stigmatize uh, uh, Black communities, but also divest them of their rightful equitable share uh, in, in the nation's largesse, right? In, in the uh, redistribution of, of national wealth towards the creation of a middle class, towards the creation of a housing market, uh, towards the creation of the financial tools uh, that we are kind of commonplace today, right? We, everyone knows that you want to buy a house, uh, you can certainly pay cash, but there's strong uh, built-in incentives for you to leverage that real estate with a mortgage uh, that, that you will benefit uh, from uh, in our tax code uh, that will allow you to uh, manage these payments over time, that all of that, right, is, is, is a system that we designed. When we designed that system uh, in the New Deal as, as, as covered in, in uh, subsequent chapters uh, to create the type of stability to tame uh, capitalism uh, and regulate it such that we can uh, prevent the, the frequent shocks uh, and crises that were characteristic of American capitalism uh, from uh, the, the mid 1800s up to the New Deal, uh, that we can put in structures that spread wealth, that create stability, uh, that create a path to prosperity in the middle class and even uh, multi-generational wealth. Uh, that all of that uh, is uh, happening uh, after uh, the Reconstruction Amendments, and it happens in a racialized way. Uh, but by the time uh, we get to uh, our contemporary period, all of this seems forgotten. Uh, on 
uh, page, uh, let's see, I'm in the preface here. On page uh, uh, 13 of the preface, the uh, Rothstein references uh, a opinion of the Supreme Court in 2007, uh, uh, authored by Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, the uh, uh, case is called Parents Involved, uh, and it involves uh, a, a scheme to desegregate school districts uh, in both uh, Louisville and Seattle. These were two different cases that were combined uh, when they reached the Supreme Court. Uh, and both of these uh, school systems had devised systems to desegregate uh, their, their school districts that the court struck down. Um, uh, and uh, uh, Rothstein choosing this case, uh, uh, when I first started reading this and, you know, I saw parents involved being cited here, and you have to go to the notes and you can get more information on the actual case. Um, uh, when I see this case cited here, uh, it, it, it popped out to me because the, those who study these issues know that uh, Chief Roberts' uh, logic and, and decision in this case, uh, in the context of, of the court's um, uh, racial jurisprudence, uh, is stunning. Uh, right? He, he says, uh, and, and uh, Rothstein captures here in uh, the bottom paragraph on uh, page 13 into page 14, uh, that, um, and I'm reading here the last sentence on page 13, he observed that racially separate neighborhoods, uh, and obviously the racially separate neighborhoods is important because the uh, school desegregation scheme is uh, uh, designed in the context of racial uh, residential segregation. He observed that racially separate neighborhoods might result from societal discrimination, but said that remedying discrimination not traceable to government's own actions can never justify a constitutionally acceptable racially conscious remedy. Uh, he goes on to, to quote, where racial imbalance is the product uh, not of state action, but of private choices. It does not have constitutional implications. Um, Rothstein obviously takes a specific aim at this quote, uh, as should anybody who has uh, even a passing understanding of our nation's uh, racial history. Um, uh, and uh, it is a, um, uh, 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 Justice Roberts' claim here uh, it has to, to look past uh, not only a history that is uh, pretty well known and, and certainly uh, 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 written about considerably, uh, but the own petitioner's briefs, uh, which uh, included information about this as well. Uh, and Justice Roberts is tapping into uh, the narrative I just previewed for you, right? That if, if, if these uh, uh, the patterns of, of, of our uh, cities and, and how they are spatially organized uh, is the result of these natural factors, then, then there's nothing else for government to do, right? We simply have to change hearts and minds, right? We hear that a lot. We want to change hearts and minds uh, as if uh, this is a problem of, of hearts and minds. And oftentimes uh, the um, uh, narratives and rationalizations that we hew to to kind of uh, understand what's going on around us, uh, you know, have uh, influence on uh, the the uh, on the ways in which we imagine uh, how we might fix those things, how we might address those things. Um, and so Rothstein, in singling out Justice Roberts' uh, uh, comments here in the parents involved case, is taking specific aim at the notion that uh, this should be understood in the same kind of individualistic or individual-centered uh, uh, framework uh, that we like to think of most things that are happening in, in, in our country, right? Uh, uh, which is in a highly individualized way, uh, as opposed to uh, being, um, uh, uh, having a, a broader set of, of structural uh, underpinnings and, uh, and forces uh, that are shaping the decisions that individuals make, uh, that are uh, offering incentives or disincentives for certain behavior uh, that is then reflected in mass uh, in the marketplace uh, and in society. 
that is important here um, uh, because ultimately, as, as we will come around to the end of the book, um, uh, Rothstein is, is, is making uh, a constitutional uh, argument here uh, about what, is, uh, what are the implications of, of housing discrimination uh, writ large and, and, and the policy apparatus that supports it. Um, and, and how we should think about it vis-a-vis -vis, um, the, the broader uh, specter of civil rights uh, legislation and, and, and constitutional protections. Um, so he sets that up. Uh, he ends the preface on page 17 by saying, we have created a caste system in this country with African Americans kept exploited and geographically separate by racially explicit government policies. Um, and, and that sets the tone for um, how Rothstein is, is asking us to think about these issues uh, uh, throughout the book. Chapter one, um, uh, if San Francisco then, then everywhere, uh, is doing very specific work, right? It is giving us the narrative uh, uh, of housing discrimination, employment discrimination uh, against the backdrop of uh, industrialization, uh, pre and post war, uh, of, uh, of, of urbanization and suburbanization in, uh, in the San Francisco market in particular, uh, and how that is impacting uh, 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 African-American uh, employees, uh, and others who uh, Mexican employees and, and black employees are specifically targeted uh, in some of the um, uh, actions that, that Rothstein highlights. How that's impacting their ability to live stable um, uh, lives uh, for their family, to build wealth, uh, to uh, earn a living, uh, and to have somewhere to live. Uh, and so I, I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but uh, I do think it is helpful uh, because, um, uh, again, this is the, the role of narrative in the book um, in, in helping uh, kind of paint vivid pictures for us. And I, I found, uh, as you may have, reading chapter one, uh, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Stevenson, I think is the uh, uh, gentleman who he chooses to profile uh, here. Um, I'm thinking of him. Um, now, I'm not just thinking of him, right? I'm thinking about his family today. Uh, I'm thinking about how uh, they might be able to leverage equity in a home uh, to send someone to college, to cover uh, emergency medical bills, uh, to uh, help uh, another relative with a down payment for another home. All of the things that happen in families, right? The intergenerational wealth transfers uh, that uh, for many people, particularly middle class and, and, and others, um, are a part of, of kind of the resources that they leverage to, to you know, conduct their lives. And if we think about Stevenson's experience uh, uh, in uh, uh, mid-century San Francisco, uh, the barriers that are erected uh, to securing housing, meaning that because of segregation, uh, black uh, housing seekers are um, relegated to uh, constrained ge uh, geographies where uh, the cost of housing is inflated. Uh, they're already earning less for doing the same work as their white counterparts, uh, and their work is much more precarious, right? Uh, their status is much more precarious. Uh, we may have heard the term uh, last hired, first fired. Uh, that comes from uh, this area, this, this era uh, uh, of structural limits on black employment uh, and ability to, to earn a living. Uh, you put on top of that the restrictions on where you can live, uh, what that does to things as mundane as your daily commute, the additional costs that it, it puts on you, the additional stresses that it puts on you, the limits that um, uh, accrue to uh, your children and other family members, the, the constraints uh, and the specter of scarcity that all of that creates. Uh, what Rothstein is doing for us here uh, is giving us a much more nuanced uh, view of how these forces 
um, uh, be they corporate decisions by Ford Motor Company, by uh, the homeowners associations, uh, the, uh, the developers, uh, the FHA, all of which are implicated in, in the, the storytelling in this chapter, how all of those things kind of fit together to constrain choices, um, uh, to limit resources, and set us up, as we can imagine, for the kind of structural wealth and income gaps uh, that we see across uh, race in today's society. Right, I've, I've talked to my students before and said, you know, how, how might we understand the racial wealth gap? Uh, and, and, and a student of mine, very well-meaning, uh, and we're in, we're in the classroom, so I always make my classroom safe spaces, and I want students to be as brutally honest as possible, um, and said, well, you know, uh, I have a friend who's African-American, and I, I noticed that um, he uh, likes to spend a lot of money on shoes. Um, and, and I said, okay, well, well, how might we think of that in the context of, of the racial wealth gap? And, and, and the student said, well, you know, maybe if he made different choices, maybe uh, he might have uh, more disposable income or more savings, and, and maybe his family could uh, have um, a better, uh, have had better financial opportunities. Um, and that's a view shared by many people across race and class, right? That um, uh, the racial wealth gap in part is the result of these individual choices. Again, I'm going back to where I started, right? That our default prism for understanding inequality is usually through uh, these kind of individualized choice making uh, narratives uh, that have the uh, sometimes intended, sometimes unintended consequence of, of justifying our withdrawal, our disengagement, uh, our uh, disdain, um, uh, and stigmatizing of certain people and their choices, right? And so uh, going back to my students, um, uh, 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 you know, offering of an explanation for the racial wealth gap here, you know, it invited a conversation that we uh, subsequently had about these structural underpinnings, right? That it may not uh, it, it may not be helpful for us to look at these individual choice making, right? I, I know many people who make uh, poor choices, uh, white, black, rich, poor, others. Um, but when we look at the scale and the scope of the racial wealth gaps, uh, there's something, uh, and their persistence, right? Their persistence across uh, generations. Uh, these gaps are naturally widening, right? They're not narrowing. Uh, they're getting worse. Uh, we should expect that if we know anything about the law of compound interest, right? Um, but uh, it seems natural to us uh, that people's choice making is to, to blame. And, and what, uh, what Rothstein is trying to paint for us in, um, in this first chapter is this broad narrative uh, that has all of these factors that are contributing uh, to uh, what the Stevensons are experiencing and, and inviting us to think about what might be the cumulative consequences of those uh, uh, structural choices, uh, those laws, those policies, those politics, those private decisions as time goes on. And might that uh, uh, offer a, a much more robust and nuanced um, uh, explanation for uh, the racial wealth gaps that we see today uh, than uh, whether someone, you know, is, is uh, spending too much money on shoes or, or discretionary items. So I, I think this is uh, an important chapter to kind of give us uh, uh, in kind of broad sweeping fashion uh, a narrative about Frank Stevenson uh, that um, uh, is also a narrative about mid-century housing policy, uh, corporate policy, the actions of developers, uh, the actions of, of, of homeowners and neighborhoods and citizens across uh, uh, the country. Uh, chapter two, um, okay, and I, I have five minutes. I just looked up, uh, Natasha, is, is my five minutes uh, over? You got, about three. you got about three, and I know okay. you're gonna we're going to speed it up then. Um, uh, chapter two, Public Housing and Ghettos, uh, introduces us to uh, the design of the New Deal uh, and the uh, uh, structures in, in, in government that are set up to um, 
uh, regulate uh, the housing market that is created through New Deal policy. Um, uh, we cover uh, the 1949 uh, Housing Act uh, on through the actions of President uh, Eisenhower. Uh, we also get a, a window into, uh, again, the, the high stakes nature of what is motivating a lot of the policy design uh, and uh, decisions that are occurring in this period. On page 27, uh, uh, we talk about um, uh, in Detroit uh, campaigns against Negro invasions. The term invasion, invasion is helpful for us. Uh, yeah, and I want to put a pin there because we see it again when we get into the history of redlining. Uh, but again, it captures for us uh, what is at risk, right? That Negroes are invading. Uh, they are, when invaders come in, there is inherently a threat, uh, a sense of loss. Uh, what's on your screen right now, uh, it, you know, perfectly captures this. Uh, if you look at just the design of this ad, right, look, um, uh, shout out to, you know, mid-century um, uh, Madison Avenue uh, uh, <laughs> uh, ad designers, right? It's pretty um, uh, on the nose here. Look at these homes now right? Uh, uh, the excess mark places where Negroes lived. And so uh, the Negro invasion is upon you. Uh, as you read about in these uh, chapter two and into chapter three, uh, we then have a system of blockbusting where uh, realtors <clears throat> manipulate the fears of, of white homeowners uh, to get them to uh, sell low, to get out of the neighborhood. They then turn around and sell it uh, at an inflated value uh, to African Americans. So the, the, the notion here is that white families uh, are able to use those incentives of government-backed mortgages uh, and other uh, tools to escape to the suburbs. And this is a process that we know is white flight. I think we're familiar with that term. Uh, black buyers, however, are paying more uh, for neighborhoods that, because of their presence, are dropping in value. Uh, so this also helps us think about uh, the, the, the value, the market value of white skin, right? Uh, that having white presence in the neighborhood uh, uh, was then and to this day, when we look at the data on this, uh, it, it was one of the greatest indicators uh, of, of real estate value appreciation. Uh, and and, and non-white uh, presence uh, past what is called the tipping point, right? The, the point beyond which uh, whites are no longer living in what they perceive to be uh, a, a, a too large of a minority composition in the neighborhood uh, and start to leave. Um, uh, that is when property values drop, uh, which then uh, stigmatizes the presence of black skin in neighborhoods as a threat to stable property values. Um, uh, moving on to chapter three, and I know I'm, I'm probably over my three minutes right now. Uh, chapter three talks about racial zoning. It begins uh, with, uh, in Reconstruction, talking about uh, the Hayes tilted election uh, and uh, the end of Reconstruction and, and setting us up for um, uh, all of the efforts to reinstate white supremacy, uh, not just uh, in the South, but also in uh, the North, uh, and using the devices of uh, racial zoning, which is struck down, uh, racial covenants, uh, which we read about in chapter five, but that's coming. Uh, and it takes us through um, uh, St. Louis, uh, Oakland, um, uh, a number of other places. It introduces us to, to zoning. Uh, we see here in the picture on the screen uh, that the ability to restrict uh, in the deeds, uh, initially the restrictions were through zoning and the court strikes that bound in Buchanan v. Orley in 1917. Um, but there are many devices that are deployed to maintain uh, racial exclusivity in neighborhoods. Uh, and so we see again, uh, uh, again, the high stakes nature of it. This tract is exclusive and restricted, letting you know that it is safe for investment uh, and a safe place to, to make home. Uh, I'm viewing Natasha's presence here uh, as a sign that I need to, to wrap up. Uh, we didn't quite get to own your own home and redlining, uh, but we can talk about that in the breakout sessions uh, and in the follow-up as well. Absolutely. Thank you, Chris. And I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no problem. Getting into the good part. Um, very quickly, I wanted to go into go over the rules of engagement for our session. So just as a friendly reminder, we covered this two weeks ago. Use the book as context when possible. Discussion contributions should refer to anecdotes and facts from the color of law, especially as they affect your experiences. 
This will help broaden all participants' comprehension and ensure that we are learning together. Number two, be explicit about race and racism. Rothstein recognizes that many people use racial euphemisms as a way to overlook the devastating effects of racial exclusion. Um, so make sure that we're not using coded language. Call, call something out when, we are, when we're just having these discussions. Number three, be kind. Uh, this is a safe space. Uh, humility and vulnerability will be helpful as we go through these. and proximity and accountability. Intersectionality teaches us that we have all been affected by these policies, so we must all work to understand and improve them. With that said, we are now going to switch you guys out into breakouts. We will have facilitators in each one of your discussions. I'm going to encourage the facilitators to have you guys introduce yourselves fairly quickly since we only have about 30 minutes, and I know this, uh, that this is gonna go by pretty fast. There'll be about seven people in each breakout room, and we will have um, Chris, Anita, Nicole, and myself to kind of hop between different um, breakout rooms discussions so that we can join us with that. Thank you guys.